Okay, everybody, thanks for joining us. It's Mel here from Mommy Berries. And I've been really enjoying kind of discussing with other people some of the topics that you ask a lot of questions about. Because as a physio, my goal is to help you kind of better understand your body, I would say, so that you can play an active role in your pregnancy, your birth, and your postpartum recovery. But as you know, there's so many other professionals out there that play a role in the whole picture. And I wanted to have Ashley on today. Ashley Courtney's from Malachite Midwives here in Kelowna, the community I live in. Thanks for being here, Ashley. And um, the reason I wanted to talk with her is because I did a discussion a few months ago with an anesthesiologist about epidurals and kind of what that looks like. But then I wanted to tie someone in that's actually helping mom with the actual birth process. So kind of how does that epidural kind of make its way through your, your birth and, and what kinds of things does that influence? So thanks again, Ashley, for being here to take yeah, time out of your day. Of course. And so I kind of, we were chatting before I hit record and I just thought, I think maybe it would be helpful if we kind of start from the beginning, because I think there's a misconception that you know, if you're under the care of a midwife, you don't have the same access to pain management as if you're under the care of a doctor. And um, Ashley was kind of, we were talking about how, well, actually, why don't you answer that, Ash? Because I was curious to know how that would come up. Like, let's say I was one of your clients and I came to talk to you. Like, how would that whole conversation come up? And maybe if you just explain a little bit about, you know, as a, as a midwife, like what kinds of things do you discuss with your clients when it comes to pain management? For sure. Um, so, uh, with midwifery care, you would have the same access to all the same pain management options, uh, that you would have with a GP at the hospital. Um, so with a doctor at the hospital, um, <clears throat> and, uh, often we will go through them routinely with everyone in the third trimester. Um, we start off with natural pain management, uh, options and we go up to pharmacological pain management options. So things that involve opioids or um, laughing gas or an epidural. Um, <clears throat> sometimes we do actually have people that come into care and they tell us from the very beginning, hey, Ashley, you know, I really want midwifery care. Uh, I value the appointments and the continuity of care and the postpartum care and the, and the labor support, but I really want an epidural and that's totally okay. Um, sometimes uh, often I'll recommend to people that it's really hard to know what you'll need until you're actually in the moment. So some people that come to us thinking, I need an epidural right away, that's what they tell us. <clears throat> um, and they end up having a wonderful, uh, smooth, unmedicated birth. Um, sometimes people want the opposite and get the opposite. Um, and it's really hard to know what labor has in store until you're in it. Um, and it doesn't mean that one is better or worse or right or wrong. Um, it really depends on the whole situation on how your labor presents and how you're coping. So, um, uh, the, the biggest thing is often with midwifery care, um, if you're okay with it, we'll start uh, with the natural options and we'll slowly work our way up, seeing how things go if you need anything stronger. That being said, if someone is like, hey, I need an epidural before other options, um, we'll, we, that, that's totally okay as well. Um, <clears throat> we do often uh, recommend an epidural when someone is in active labor. Um, so that's the one thing, if you're in early labor, we can actually admit you to the hospital. And that's the same as if you were with a doctor. So um, we can't get you an epidural until you're in active labor. Um, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, right. And then so I guess the one thing I wanted to add to that is sometimes people uh, also, uh, we can, it's sometimes hard to, to guarantee it because if you are going very fast uh, and the anesthesiologist is busy because sometimes there's lots of people having babies at once. Mm -hmm. um, that can, we might, we can't 100% guarantee it, but we would definitely do our best to get it for you. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, does that make sense? Totally. And I think like, I really liked how um, you described it as an escalation. And that's exactly what like Dave, the anesthesiologist said when I was talking with him is that, um, that they think of it as an escalation. And I think that you don't always know kind of where you're going to hit. And I think that you, one time in a discussion you and I had, I'll never forget, I describe it as, I always want you to feel like there's an open door. Whereas you said, sometimes it's almost like a choose your own adventure. Like you don't, there's always different options. And I think mm -hmm. it's important. I think we all go in. I think so many of us crave a plan or crave like what that's going to look like. I think it's hard for us to let go of that plan, but just knowing that, 
it's almost like you have to meet them where they're at, I'm sure. Do you know what exactly. I mean? Exactly. Yeah. You don't know if your labor is going to start with your water breaking before contractions or if your labor is going to start fast or slow or if you're going to need to be induced for something. Um, and I think something I've recently learned for myself, you know, parenting is a process of letting go too, because it's really hard to plan. It's hard to plan when they'll have a nap or it's hard to plan totally. um, what foods they'll like, or it's hard to plan a lot and labor is included in that. <laughs> but having really good support, I think is important for labor. Um, and uh, I think that's one thing you could plan is the support. And yeah. also just like by attending this, this video series and learning like, hey, what is an epidural? What does, mm -hmm. What does it mean? Can, what is it, how does it affect my pelvic floor? I think that's pretty cool for people to be. Yeah. And I think that at the end of the day, I feel like the reason I do a lot of this is to take away fear. And I know that like, I definitely felt this. I'll never forget um, doing my prenatal class seven years ago before I knew any of this and going for the break uh, for lunch. And we had just talked about epidurals before the break and my husband goes out and he's like, what did you think of all that? So I, I don't think we should have an epidural, should we? And I looked at him and I was like, well, thank you for that. But anyways, I just feel like there's a very much a negative dark cloud over epidurals. And hi, buddy. Uh, can you speak to that a bit, Ash? Because I do love that you are kind of like, if you, if you want one or you need one, that's okay. And so can you speak to the fact that so many women feel like it's a negative or they're failing if they have one or they shouldn't have one? Um. Well, I think my favorite quote is comparison is the thief to joy. So, you know, I think one person's labor can be completely different than another person's labor. Sometimes a smooth, straightforward labor might be, you know, completely different than someone who's had a three day long, five day long, you know, long, like exhausting labor. Some, ba some babies are small, some babies are big, some babies' heads are tilted. Um, I had someone who had her 11th baby with me and she said every single one of her labors were different. So, you know, I don't think we can really say that one is better or worse. I think what we look at is how is mom coping? Mm -hmm. How is baby coping? Um, what do they need in this moment to help them get to where they want to go? So mm -hmm. um, if someone's in labor and they want an epidural, we can try and help get them to the point where they can get that and then we'll get it for them. If someone really doesn't want one, we go through everything possible. And if it's something that is needed, um, sometimes that's the only option to help you get a rest and a break and to actually help that baby come out vaginally um, because you need to rest or you need to relax uh, to help that baby come down. Yeah, and I, I wanna speak to that a little bit because I'll never forget, again, going into my first, one of my friends saying to me, and most of my friends were you know, talking all about, I, I didn't have an epidural, I didn't have an epidural. And I remember one friend saying to me, Mel, if you need to have an epidural, that is okay. And she said that might help you enjoy the process a little bit more. And so luckily I got to the point, I always say that I was, I thought I could have swore in my labor that I was 12 centimeters dilated by how I felt. And I was two. And I was like, that's it. I can't do this anymore. I had an epidural and then I thoroughly enjoyed the whole process. And so for me, it was, it was a really helpful. And, and before we started recording, you kind of mentioned that sometimes in a lot of cases, an epidural will give women that break they need or that headspace they need. So can you speak to that a little bit? For sure. Um, so if you're someone that goes into labor really not wanting it, um, I, I feel like uh, trusting your care providers, knowing that, that acknowledging that that's what you're, we're all working towards. But if it comes to a point where we're looking like, okay, there, there hasn't been change or you're looking exhausted um, or... Um, you know, there, there's certain uh, clinical aspects that come up where it could potentially be d harder for you or your baby to have a vaginal delivery without it, we would recommend it. And I've seen it be work wonders for people who are exhausted. Once you have that epidural, they can sleep. Um, and if they haven't slept in a while, that gives them energy that's needed for um, helping their baby descend and then helping them push uh, with their, get, have the enough strength behind them to help push their baby out. Yeah. Um, so, or it helps, uh, yeah. So I feel like it's, it's, and it's for that, that's what your path in that book of your choose your own adventure, we don't have control of the pages or what's coming. But if you come into that scenario where you're like, okay, I have tried everything and it's not working. It's, it's a tool that we have such fortunate access to these days mm -hmm. um, that can really, you know, if, 
maybe sometimes your baby's head is in a funny position, an epidural would help an OB be able to go in and rotate their head. If you didn't have an epidural, they wouldn't be able to comfortably do that. Um, if you're exhausted, you wouldn't be able to necessarily get as good of a rest without one. We can try uh, like other options beforehand, but if that's not working, sometimes certain things um, are needed. And because they're needed one time also doesn't mean that they'd be needed again the next time. So exactly. every birth is different. Exactly. And I always explain it as like, I obviously come at it from kind of like a like a nervous system or a muscle point of view. And I always describe that when we experience pain, our muscles tense, like that's just a normal response that our body has. And so if you're having pain that you feel like you can't breathe through um, or, or can't relax into, it's really hard to, to relax the opening, like the muscular mm-hmm. opening. You can't relax the opening, the pelvic floor that the baby needs to come out. Yeah. And that's definitely what I found is as soon as my body relaxed, I could open and I could breathe and, and everything. Ash, can you talk um, a little bit about then? So let's say um, that, you know, mom decides that she wants to have an epidural and she gets some rest. Um, can you talk a little bit about then like how that's going to influence? Because this is uh, the reason I ask this is because I do a lot of work with women kind of teaching them how to feel that they can control those muscles, how to use different visuals or breathing strategies to think about, you know, pushing that baby down to an an open pelvic floor and they work on it and they're like, yeah, great Mel, but what if I have an epidural and I can't feel any of that? What does that, what is that going to do? And I guess I I say, well, the baby still needs to come out the same hole. They're not going to change the hole. Um, You're still going to use like the same muscles and the same visuals, but can you speak a little bit to, you know, maybe what you would have to modify or different things you would have to do if someone doesn't have that sensation? For sure. Um, So often when someone gets an epidural, um, the anesthesiologist comes in and they, they'll place the epidural. It'll take a little bit of time uh, to actually start function, like uh, feeling the effects of, Um, but then once it depends on where you are in your labor um, for that, but often it'll be more of a calming, calmer environment. We want people to rest. And we wait and we check in at a certain interval to see that things are, um, everything's okay and that things are progressing. And then once someone's fully dilated with an epidural, we often give them some time to let that baby's head come down lower into the, uh, in, into the pelvis. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, that's called passive descent. And then we'll often, um, then they, the research says moms can feel a little bit more sensation. And I think that's one thing too with, an epidural is um, you will still be able to feel aspects of pushing. Um, And so that's something that they used to freeze you really strongly and you wouldn't feel anything, but now they actually have it so you can. And those are the like certain, um, the benefit of that too, is that you can also move into different positions. So we'll often be with um, people and once they're, once they're ready to start pushing, um, I would say, I'm kind of losing track of your question, but I, we try different positions and you can be, I've had people with epidurals on a squat bar. I've had people with epidurals on their hands and knees, sideline, using a peanut ball. Um, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily want you um, jumping or, but like you can definitely move around and that's also really nice. Um, sometimes people do uh, like having a little bit of guidance. Uh, sometimes that's just initially, sometimes that's the whole time. Some people don't want any guidance but sometimes it can feel nice to have a little bit of counter pressure because mm-hmm. everything can feel overwhelming and having some direction saying here, this is where I'd like some energy. This is, well, this is where, um, rather than letting it go everywhere. Absolutely. And I think that that's, I think that's going to be very much, um, care provider specific. And I think that like, I think, I guess I'm assuming that as a mom, that would be something I could ask you to do, right? You know, can you, can you show me where you need me to push or a lot of women like to have a mirror or something that they can yeah. look at. And so yeah. I, I would say as a mom, like ask those things, you know, you know, ask your care provider, do you mind doing this? Because you, everybody needs different feedback or different cues or, or different visuals. And so there's no reason you can't ask for that. Totally. And again, everyone's different. Some people don't want any help and I am more than happy to support that. Um, and sometimes it's more helping them try different positions. Um, but sometimes people do like to have a little bit of guidance. Um, in terms of the mirrors, they used to have mirrors at the hospital, but they took them away because of um, uh, 
like cleaning protocols. Right. So if you want a mirror, bring one of those handheld mirrors from the dollar store because they mm -hmm. are great to have when mm -hmm. you're squatting and you can start to see that baby's head crowning. Or if you're, you might not think you want it either. And then in the moment you might want it, it's pretty cool. That's, um, that's but you also idea. don't. That's a great idea. <laughs> Ashley, is there anything else that you feel like um, you would want moms to know? Because again, my biggest goal is that we take some of the fear out and understand that, you know, you can't always choose everything. But at, at the end of the day, you still have a lot that you can do. There's always something that you can do yep. to kind of um, feel in control. Is there anything else that you feel like we haven't touched on that that moms should know about? Um, I think... Uh... I, I have seen people that have done your prepare to push class pushing really effectively with an epidural. Um, uh, I think that it's uh, it's great to try and um, learn different um, different ways of breathing because your breath is very powerful and I really like how you approach using different muscles and um, body awareness. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I also think um, it's also good to be mindful like sometimes if there's a heart rate concern we might need you to push a different way um and sometimes um uh and and that's hard to predict um as the baby sounds happy we're happy doing very slow deliveries and as long as we see progress we're happy but if baby starts to sound like they're tired or they're not coping then we often have to kind of try and find a way to help get them out earlier because we, we we're hearing that they're stressed um absolutely so, yeah absolutely i think and I think at the end of the day, um, you know, what you were alluding to that, that prepare to push thing, I feel like I'm always updating my messaging too, because um, I think that it's important for women to know that there isn't just right one right way. And I just had a client the other day that I'll just touch on before I let you go here, but she definitely mentioned that she said, I'm so glad that we talked about this stuff before, because I felt in control of my muscles and I could tell throughout my pushing that I need to cycle through different ways. And sometimes I needed to create a lot of pressure and push, but then I needed to breathe and push. And, but she felt like she could um, coordinate that based on, you know, some of the things that her midwife was saying and some of the things that she was feeling. And I love that you, you touch on that is that we don't always know how it's going to go. We don't always know what the baby's doing, but I think just being ready for anything and knowing how you have control over that is, I guess, my ultimate goal. Totally. I, I, I 100% agree with that. Um, and, uh, and I think the research even says that um, it doesn't necessarily matter if someone ends up with a C-section versus a vaginal delivery for how they feel about their birth. If they feel empowered along the way, that's really the most important. Because some people, if you feel empowered and you're like, okay, you know, I, I've done all these things and I need an epidural and that's okay. I felt like I had a choice in when that was. I felt like I was a part of the process. Mm -hmm. um that's that can make a very big difference on your experience of labor and trying to take away that competitiveness because there's so much like mom guilt out there you don't I mean it, if something is right for you it'll be right for you and trying not to compare yourself to others because everything is not a competition right mm -hmm. it's it, and, and everything is so different for every single person yeah. that's what I love about our job is we, birth isn't the same Totally. I get like goosebumps when you say that. I love it. I love that <laughs> that's like a perfect place to end. And um, thank you so much for, yeah. for taking the time. And um, I appreciate everything that you do. Oh, I appreciate everything you do too. And I hope this helps people um, take away that fear. Awesome. For sure. Yeah. Thank you so much. Have a good day.